Welcome to the Dorm and Lunch and Learn. Today we're doing low current clamp component testing. And what we want to focus on today is making sure you can use your amp clamp on your meter. Why? Well, you know your meter has a 10 amp fuse and you don't want to go poof with it, right? And we're going to show you the difference. We got two different amp clamps. We have one from Curian, we have one from OTC SPX that has a little meter on it. And you're going to see the difference in the reading. There'll be minute differences, okay? That's just the way the clamps are and how you zero them, all right? And as we're going through, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Please feel free to ask anything. I don't know everything, but I know a lot. And I'm willing to share what I know. You could share what you know, because you know something I don't even know, right? And the other person don't know. It's just the way it is. So I only have, I'm your instructor, G. Trulia. I only have the G and a half and O. If I had the other half and O and D, I'd be God. Only God knows everything. So please remember that. We're going to use our brain, eyes, ears, nose, and hands, and basically go through and test this stuff. So let's take a, a look here what we're going to do. How to test actuators using a current or amp clamp. Using the amp clamp on a meter and using it on a lab scope. So it doesn't matter if you have this clamp here, the ADI-110. That's probably about 700 plus bucks nowadays. You don't have to buy that. You could use a PDI amp clamp. And these PDIs, they're both about 100 and something, maybe 110 each. They're not as accurate as this one, but pff, come on, it's good enough, right? I'm going to show you a couple of things you can do with this. And what you can do with this, this just picks the pepper out of the fly dough. That clamp was very expensive when I bought it years back. But this one, if you want to do parasitic draw, you may want, to, may want to write this number down, an I-30S. I-30S, this is super, super accurate, and I highly recommend that you get it if you're going to do parasitic draw. We're not doing parasitic draw here today, but we'll go through a couple of slides before we go on there. Now, if you have the old PDI amp clamp or OTC, it was the same one, you basically take a sticker here and go over the first notch, what you want to know on these, is 100 millivolts equals 1 amp. That is super important. Just like here, you would want to select, uh, select 100 milliamps equals um, 1 amp. So if you were reading this, you see 450? 450 milliamps, how much? Type in. We're giving away a free doorman shirt, okay? So that free doorman shirt, type in your email if you get it right and we'll be sure to get it out to you. So what am I reading there? The first person right here, what am I reading? Every 100 millivolts equals an amp. This is a conversion. How much amperage am I reading? And let's see what we got there. 4.5 volts. Uh, where's that? 4.5 volts, no. 4.5 amps, who's the first guy with the 4.5 amps? Four. Paul, four amps, 503 milliamps would be correct. Okay, that's the thing that confuses people on this. So, Paul, if you write in your email, um, then you will win that T-shirt. Now, I do want you to look at this, and I'm going to blow this up a little bit. Oh, I'm going to blow that up a little bit. Now, what I want you to see is, number one, you see a headlight on my student's pants there? And I use this slide a lot for uh, good reasons. One, the most accurate way of measuring current is through the meter here, right? And we're in our common jack and our 10 amp jack, but that's only a 10 amp fuse. So if you see how it's set up, the black lead is to the battery post, the red lead is going through a 10 amp circuit breaker in the ATC fuse. The other part of it, which would be the red part of the lead to the meter, is going to the clamp. Why? Because if I did this setup without that circuit breaker, the fuse would burn out. Because how much is a headlight? About 5 amps, right? And if we have 5 amps, 2 headlights, that's 10 amps. Parking bulbs, probably seven, 800 milli uh, amps each. Excuse me, 2 up front, probably 4 in the back, a license plate light. You could see where we're reading. How much amperage are we reading there? For a doorman hat, this is easy. First person to come in, you got to give me the full amount. One, four, two, one. How much amperage total, including the milliamps? Including the milliamps, first person. 
He had a dormant hat. Not that hard. You guys got it. Come on. I know there may be a little bit of a delay. That's right. This is the delay one. I forgot about that. Okay. So first person, what am I reading there on that? Okay, but give me, give me the exact amount. There we go. And Sean, uh, he has one amp. No. 14 amps, 210, Tony. Very good. Now, Tony, put your email in there, and let's explain this. You see 1421? There's always a zero here. So if you're going to read this to a hotline, it would be 14 amps, 210 milliamps. If you have a meter that has five digits, in other words, an extra digit right here at the end, you would see that 210. Prop away. It's picking the pepper out of the fly do, I know, but it's the right thing to do. Now, for a dormant t-shirt, let's go over and notice, here's the amp clamp. We're set to 1 MV equals 10 MV, or as we said in the sticker, the first one is 100 millivolts equals 1 amp. Now, here's what you're reading. 1.456. 1.456, we are on the voltage scale. This, I'll give you a Dorman t-shirt and a Dorman hat, because this is a harder one, okay? This is a harder one. What am I reading here? I'll keep that highlighted, 1.456. What am I reading? First person, 1.456. Give me the whole reading. First person gets it. I'm going to look here, see if anyone is coming in. And I know there's a little bit of a delay there, so let's get that in there. Okay, Sean has 14 amps, 560. Sean, what are you missing? You're close. You're missing the zero, right? But we'll give it to you, Sean. Let's give it to Sean. And let's give it to, what's that guy's name? Something with an F for... A, Hussein, 1 amp, 456, he got it. Let's give it to both. You guys put your stuff in there. Now, why? How's it 14 amps, someone's going to say? You got 1.46. Let's cover the 1. Forget about the 1. Every three, every 300, uh, every 100 millivolts equals an amp. 456, that would be 4 amps, 560 milliamps. But how about the number 1? Number 1. Well, it's only one amp, G. No, it's not. 100 millivolts equals one amp. Ten times that number. One equals ten. Please write this down. Two equals 20. So if there was a number two there. Three equals 30, and so on and so forth. Does everyone get that? The first digit, when it says one dot, if that was a two, once again, that'd be 20. Since that's a one, 14 amps, 560. Now, it's a little bit different than the actual amp meter of 14 amps, 210 milliamps, correct? It's a little off, but it's close enough, meaning this clamp is not super accurate for high amperage. Does that make sense? It's not super accurate for that. But if I'm reading very low current, like a fuel injector or something, like these clamps here that we're going to be on, switch please. These clamps right here are going to be very, very similar in readings, okay? And there's two different clamps there. We got an OTC clamp that has a meter in it, and we have a Curian clamp here, which basically also has something in there. My meter went off, okay? So we'll be looking at it on a meter and on a lab scope, okay? We're going to be doing that hands-on in a minute. Any questions on this? If you have any questions, please type it in. Now, if you take this big inexpensive clamp and you can't use this for parasitic draw, why? Just like that little clamp we just seen here, this is for low current. It's not as accurate at 14 plus amps, okay? So here, we got a question? Okay, let me see what the question is. I, can we assume the missing place could be 14? Yeah, don't read what you got to do when you see number one, Sean. The one is basically 10 amps. So if you do the math, every 100 millivolts, how many millivolts in one volt? Okay, there's 1,000. Break that up, it'll be 10. Okay? All right. So 
This clamp here is for starter motors. So look what we did here. The high current uh, labeled peak current is normal after the initial surge. The current in the starter circuit falls to a lower steadier level. In this example, initial current falls from a brief initial peak, this peak here that'll blow up in a second, of over 400 plus amps to a steady cranking current of approximately 165 amps, all these humps. So there, and you can talk about that, we're not going to worry, but let me blow this up. Now, you see, this is called IR, initial rush. So right here is zero amps. You crank the solenoid, 50 amps. We go up roughly to about 400 amps. We fall down to 160. You could use this for relative compression and actually see the starter draw. Does that make sense to everyone? Now, that's on the high current clamp. That's the high current clamp, right? So the photo shows the current probe, sometimes referred to as an amp clamp. The probe is connected to the scope input channel, which is adjusted to a low millivolt scale, commonly 50 or 100 millivolts. Then the probe is clamped around the main battery cable while the engine is cranked. You disable fuel there. Or around the main alternator B+, where you can measure the charging current with the engine running. Always make sure, by the way, that your amp clamps have good batteries in them, okay? Now here, when you look at this clamp, would be good, but can that get around all battery cables? And a little note here, please write down, the jaws must be clean. The jaws the magnet. This is a steel bar with windings around it, okay? This is the clamp, the I-30S. I like an I, 30, S like in Sam, or I in Indigo, right? The yellow clamp uh, to the left is the Fluke I-30S. And be careful, don't buy anything but that number. They have one that looks like this. And you see that jaw? It's big enough to get around all the cables to measure power to city draw. That's the best amp clamp to use because of the size of the jaw that fits around the battery cable. The specifications on the DC range are 30 milliamps to 30 amp, meaning if you go over 30 amps, it's not accurate. Can I use that on a starter circuit? No, not gonna be accurate. Would you get a reading? Yes, but it'll be at a range. You gotta use the right tool for the right job, okay? So here, um, bu -bu -bu -bu, with dead accuracy, there's no problem using it on any vehicle for power to the drawer or battery off key drains. The Fluke ADI-110, that's this one here, above left on and off switch settings with two input levels for low and high resolution measurements. Like the high current probe, each 10 millivolts or 100 millivolts, I would circle the slide number nine, 10 millivolts, remember? 100 millivolts. When we went back here, ooh, remember this? You take that clamp and the first notch is 10 millivolts, really equals 100 millivolts. Um, the low amp probe is accurate to very low current measurements, including milliamp readings associated with key off battery drain. Problem with this clamp, and I still have it, I have this thing mm, from the late 80s, believe it or not. And it's a great clamp, but that jaw cannot be used correctly to go around all the wiring of a battery post. Now, to give you an idea how voltage and amperage works, if we connect the scope, to a fuel injector using conventional voltage probes, that means you're gonna go negative to a good ground, positive to the trigger side, the ground side, the PCM side of the circuit, we're gonna basically get this blue signal. And this is our system voltage. Notice we're at 10 volts per division. This is my zero, that'd be 10. Notice you're above 12 volts going to ground. So you can check your alternator output. The peak voltage, you want a minimum of 35 volts, that'd be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, about 62 without using any type of curses on there. And we're at 100 millivolts per division. That equals what? That's right, one amp. And notice where this injector is, that's ground. This would be our pintle bump here at about 60%. And that injector is pulling one amp. So you can see as voltage goes down, amperage rises. It's a real good way. And where do we have our amp clamp? 
on the same exact, very important, same exact injector, one of the two wires. It doesn't matter since it's a series circuit. If you're on the black wire or red wire or whatever the colors are, don't matter, right? If it's upside down, you need to flip your, your clamp around. So if this right here was the opposite way, just take the clamp, flip it, or go to the other wire, okay? But you got to be on the same exact injector or you may not see this or this. It'll be else. Usually if you trigger off voltage, amperage won't show up and you'll get frustrated. So we're trying to give you an idea how to use the amp clamp and any questions you have. Any questions up there yet? Okay. Please ask them. Okay, so let's do it live because that's how we do things the best. So I'm going to go down here and I'll have to make some camera adjustments and stuff. And we're going to do something very simple first. We're going to look at this light bulb, okay? Now, everyone hates Ohm's law, but if you, you know, took your meter, zeroed it out, and figured what that bulb would take, okay, we are connected to a scope and to a meter. First, I want to show you, I'm going to check continuity. I have the power probe noise off. You all know it would do this. Very annoying. Okay, so I have it off, right? You can see the light, I think. Yeah, you can see the green light right there. Yep. So it lets me know I have continuity. I press the button, mm. and I got amperage flow, okay? Now, I got to put my amp clamps on. So one of the things I'm going to do here is zoom in. Well, that was zoom out, dummy. Zoom in, and I want to show you the amp clamps. We'll get to the question in a second. I want to go here to the 20 amp scale. This is how this company does it. And I want to zero the clamp. You see it drifting? I want to take this button and I want to kind of turn it and get it. You don't see it drifting. Oh, yeah. You don't see it drifting because very good. Thank you for that. Okay, so we got to try to get it as close as possible, and that's pretty good, okay? Now, the scope. I always got to remember, everything's backwards on this thing. Okay, so I want to show you that here, this is our zero line. So I want to take the red, you see the red channel, and I just want to show you the bottom, you see this line here? I'm going to put that right over the red, superimpose it. And when I put amperage on, I'm going to move the upper one down so you can see what the reading is in this number up here. Okay? So ready? I got to put this other clamp on as well, DC, zero it. And what I meant by that other clamp, let me go down and show you this clamp right here. Hit zero. And notice they all drift a little bit. Why? You always want to be zeroing your clamp near the electric source that you're going to be doing. Not out here in the middle of nowhere, right? Somewhere near it. And let's see what that question is. How many dead batteries until they go to uh, Quite a bit. Uh, you could use a low amp clamp as long as the clamp will close if you couple it. Yes, that is very uh, good. I did mention that before. And you definitely want to make sure the jaw, if you could close it, okay, you can do that. So now I'm going to put the load on. You can see the light back here, reflection of the light bulb, or if you want, I don't know. Well, you can see it. Bulb's on. So you're looking at 200 and something, 204 milliamps, right? Now here, let's move that cursor line. And by the way, you're looking at 216. Could they see that, or I got to give them one more shot in? You got to give them one more shot in. There you go. Okay. Here we're up. And so there's the meter. This backward stuff kills me. I know. <laughs> so there, there's the 216. Is it a little bit different? Yeah. Every clamp is going to make a difference. Now, look at the amp clamp down here. Look at the amperage right on the clamp. <laughs> Murphy's Law. Okay. So that's 210, 29. The meter was 24. 
right? But that is splitting hairs in milliamps. And remember, it's a conversion to amperage. Does everyone understand that? Any questions on that? So a bulb is something that I would highly recommend you start with. Why? Because you could take your meter and read the resistance of the bulb, take the voltage source, in this case, our, our meter right here, right? Our power probe, and notice I have 12 volts. I could take that and do the Ohm's law calculation. Does that make sense? So once you do that and you get used to going, oh, okay, there's the amperage on that, right? Then it'll be life made easy. Now, let's take something different here. Let's take a component. Like it said, we were going to do, and a bulb is a component, but it's a hot bulb, by the way. Let's take a typical fuel injector. Okay, so here's our fuel injector. And the fuel injector here, I have these appropriate wire ends hooked up so we're in to the pins itself, see? There's the little pin. And now I'm going to put this here. And you all know it's way better than trying to get your power probe on there. It's more difficult with the power probe. So now I'm going to take the power probe ground lead. And I'm going to put that in here. And I want you to take notice. I do not have continuity on the meter until I do this. You see the green light right there? Okay. Now I have continuity. So now we can measure, and I have a question. How much is an injector like this going to actually take? How much is an injector, how much current is that going to actually pull? And remember, this is pretty simple. This is a steel bar with windings. And it's not that hard for you to do. But you need to know what the expected current is. So there's no gasoline pressure going through the top of that injector. Would we all agree? And what does a manufacturer always tell you to do when you're checking an injector? Did they tell you to do amperage? Did they tell you to check voltage? Did they tell you to check current? Which one? Which one? Now I'm going to wait, take a sip of water here. I'm going to look at my screen. Is that coming from the bottom up? or I, top, all these, top. top. Any risk, good question there, Brad. Any risk on connecting backwards and damaging an injector? Um, let's talk about that right there. So the OEM says voltage. Well, you guys that said resistance, yeah, that's what they usually do. But let's talk about what Brad said for a second. If I hook it up backwards... Is there any chance of damaging a component? And I'll give away a dormant t-shirt. Is there any risk, and you gotta tell me why. So you just can't say, oh yeah, or oh no. Is there any risk? Because Brad brings up a very good point. So you gotta tell me, if there's a risk, why? If not, why? Free dormant t-shirt, okay. Okay, Mike says no risk. Anyone else? No, it's not. It's a coil in it. It's a coil in it, okay. No, because windings, if it's more than 1.2 amps, yes. MOSFET, uh, PC unplugged, no power. There's polarity, series circuit. Okay, please write this down. So no one got the right answer, okay. What you have to be aware of, you all heard of Bosch, Siemens, Sachs, Pierberg, all German companies, right? And these German companies, they use diodes in some of these things. And if I put the wrong thing, did that guy put the diode up there yes, before I yacked it? The diode okay. be there. Well, it's delayed. Yeah, so give him, dude with the diode, uh, Dave. Dave. Put your email in, you want it, very good. So if there's a diode and I go the opposite way, it's a smoke show. Because a diode only flows voltage or current in one direction, right? We don't want to do it in both directions. So please write that down to make sure you understand that. 
Now, what do you do to prevent that? Going back to, well, I suck at names, I forgot the guy's name already. The gentleman who asked the question, maybe it was Brad, I can't remember. But at any rate, the, the uh, wiring going to it, what you need to do is turn the key off or the power button, make sure when you unplug it, now turn the key back on or power button on, is it this side has power or that side? Why? Because then you're going to take this trusty power probe and you're going to go to the side with power and the side with ground. Never, ever leave the component plugged in. Because if you have it plugged in and you go, and I love when people go, oh, I did that real quick. So quick I did that? Smoke show. Smoke show. Why? Anything more, and someone put this up, than six milliseconds, they must have been in one of my classes, thank you. Anything more than six milliseconds, excuse me, is going to burn that diode out or burn a driver out if you're connected to that injector going back to the computer. Don't do that. So let's review again. You turn the key or power button off, you unplug it. This is called indexing. You then put the button back on. You check, is it this side with power or that side with power? Then you go to the component, like I'm going here. We're going to go to the component, and I'm going to put power or ground to the correct side. Okay. Now, that being said, how much amperage do you think I'm going to pull? And remember, the OEs only ask you for ohms. So let me get one of my ballpoint pens here and bring a point across. There is electrical resistance, and then there's mechanical resistance. So here I'm going to talk about mechanical resistance. This is like... Can you all see that ballpoint going in and out? Yeah. Probably see my big nose in the picture, but the ballpoint you probably can't see. Let's see if Doreen can get in close on it. Oh, yeah, I see it. If, they, if I can see it, they can see it. See that? Now, if I had a regular injector, 12 to 15 ohms is pretty much normal, but how about if I had mechanical resistance? Oh, but GM or Toyota or Mercedes, they told me to check resistance. Resistance is not always good because mechanical resistance here, if this ballpoint pen, which is the injector blade, was stuck, okay, and could not come out, couldn't do this, could not come out because maybe the pintle is bent, maybe there's carbon built up there. What happens to current? For a doorman hat, what happens to current? What do you think happens to current? First guy, where does current go? if I have physical resistance. First guy, let's see it. And remember, it's 1,000 milliseconds in one second. Goes up. So Anthony, type your email in there. Okay? That is the correct answer. Okay? So physical resistance makes amperage go up, and it doesn't mean a thing what the OE manufacturer told you. What they're doing is they're looking for if you get OL or if you get low resistance, low, and that would be electrical resistance. Low electrical resistance equals what? Low electrical resistance equals what? High amperage, high amperage. Okay, so now let's check this injector. I'm gonna go in here, show you I got continuity. My amp clamp went off again, so I gotta turn it back on. Okay, I gotta re-zero. And let's go to this camera so we can see. Okay, so here we go. Where's our amperage? Now you see 77.1? Look at the meter. You see that? You read that. You don't read the decimal. That is 723 milliamps. How about on my scope? Okay. Well, here on my scope, oh, now that I just fell off the wire, Seven hundred and twenty. Is there a difference? And by the way, do you see the amperage going down here? Why? Because I am heating up. If you heat up the windings in here, resistance changes and you get amperage, right? That's what's going on there. Everyone okay with that? Let's see if we got anything there. Okay. If resistance is low, amperage is high. So the way Richard put it there, resistance... 
rises, amperage rises. So no, as resistance goes up, amperage goes down. If resistance goes low, and don't worry about getting stuff wrong. Don't take it the wrong way going, oh, he's a real big a-hole saying I got it wrong. We all get it wrong. I made plenty of mistakes. We're all going to make mistakes. You know why? Because we're human. Going to make a mistake, right? So, okay, let's get rid of this. Let's do a fuel pump. And how much do you think this fuel pump right here is going to give me an amperage? So, same thing. I put my component, ground, and power. Now, remember, this is a lot safer doing it this way. I do have continuity. See the green? Mm -hmm. So let's see what this does. And this is going to be a little noisy. Uh, my amp clamp went off over here. So I roughly got, if we look at the scope, 560 milliamps, okay? Well, every 100 millivolts equals an amp, he said. And notice it locked it in on my scope, okay? I could put min-max on my meter and, of course, knock my lead off, but who's counting? Now, that was the initial rush. That's one thing you always got to be careful of when you first put it on. But right there, I'm going to hit it on hold. So you see the numbers? It bounced around a lot on that. I have 506 millivolts. Do not count the decimal. That's 5 amps. And what do I have here? 560 millivolts. Every 100 millivolts, every 100 millivolts equals an amp. And of course, a fuel pump. Do you know what's the average fuel pump amperage? The average when you, and I better say this, because sometimes at idle, you are using very little current because they don't want the fuel going up there, right? It's going to take heat on. So what are they going to do? They're going to spin the pump slower with a variable speed fuel pump, which is run through the computer, okay? So most pumps at idle nowadays will not be pulling out the high current. Let's say this is grams per air going through the mass, fill, uh, air, mass airflow sensor. Uh, APP, accelerator pedal position, is engaged. And your Prindle, park reverse drive, is in drive, unless you're a little crazy going fast in reverse, okay? And you got VSS, vehicle speed. What is the normal current? Let me take a peek here. Uh, very good there, Hussein. Uh, six to eight amps, and that's on the money. Did he win anything yet? I think he did. Yeah, give him a hat. Give him a hat as well. So you're going to get a hat. Very good. Okay, Richard, that's good. So you understand. That's your job. Okay. And my job is to help you understand. And I remember in the beginning, I was confused to live in hell, okay? Why? Because they don't put all this stuff in books. How do you get good at something? Practice makes perfect. You know, you can look at all the magazines you want. You can look at the videos, wish you can make those moves, or doing it. This is doing it. This is how you're going to get good. Try to pair up with your friends, maybe an hour after work or on the weekend or something, and you know, you want to be around the family, I understand. But the more you put in to doing this by hand, okay, the better off you're going to be and the better technician you're going to wind up being. It's going to save you time in the base. And you shop owners out there, you know, sometimes maybe hang around. Pull this video up and practice. You could go back and do this by throwing the video up in the background. Don't cost you a thing. Thanks to Dorman Products, okay? Go to the Dorman Training Site, or if you can't find it there, you just go to ATTS of the Dorman Lunch and Learn, okay? And we have a whole bunch of those videos. And thank you guys when I see you on the road and you say, hey, you know, that webinar really helped me. And people like this Lunch and Learn. And I do apologize for it being on a Monday 
as I said earlier, in case you came on late, we try to do them on Wednesdays, but it is very busy this time of year, and unfortunately, I will be, or fortunately, I guess, I'll be on the road tomorrow. So it's impossible to do. This is live. You're not watching me uh, on some video thing, okay? So here we are going to take this EGR valve. So let's take this EGR valve. Oh, Bill asked, how many amps for a bad fuel pump? Well, Bill, that's a good question. I kind of like that. It could be too low or too high. Too low could be this fuel pump is worn, okay? The armature and the brushes are worn, or the pickup is not all the way in the gas. If we're not pushing, you see this pump? It wasn't going to pull the correct amount of amperage that so-called so six to eight is many, usually six to number one number, okay, of current, if the pump has a problem. So the, it would be on the low side. Now, if it had high amperage, you could have a clog filter, okay, on the outside of the pump. You could have a crushed line where the pump is pushing uh, gasoline, but the line is crimped, okay? We could have a binding armature inside here. That would give us high amperage. So high or low is no good. And how many do you do current ramping? current ramping. Now when you current ramp the pump, we should get nice Humpty Dumpties. This pump, unfortunately, try it again. Let me see if I can get a reading on the lab scope for you that's not too hairy. So just bear with me one second here and we'll look at the scope. Okay. Well, this pump is all over the place. Come on, hold. Thank you. So you see these little Humpty Dumpties here? Let me move the uh, let me move that cursor out of the way. You see these humps? This first part is actually okay, but you see this going down? Anything more than a box difference? Here's the box. You see this line from here to here? Are we up here and down here? Yeah. That is bad. When I used to fly rotary, if that pump in that helicopter was that bad, my butt ain't going up there. You know why? Auto rotate is a little scary. It's a hard down, okay? This pump has a problem. This pump came out of a problem vehicle. That makes sense? So we should all do current ramping. That is important. Any questions on it? Like a sawtooth? Well, more of a round hump is what you want to say. Richard, I was thinking mechanical resistance gets harder as resistance rises. So was thinking resistance as force and not as ohms. Uh, so does mechanical resistance affect amperage? It, uh, it makes it rise, correct? Yes. Okay. So don't get this mixed up. Electrical resistance, let's break this down one more time. Electrical resistance, the lower the resistance, ohms, the higher the amperage. Okay? If you had high resistance, still electrical, you're going to have low current flow, low amps. Okay? Now, mechanical resistance, forget about electric. If this is supposed to push through here, it's supposed to move this like this, and this has a problem like that pintle, and it can't move it, Amperage goes up. Think of it like this. If we took all the spark plugs out of a good motor and had the proper oil in it, let's take a Honda 020, and it's stone cold out, the amperage would be less than when we put the plugs back in. Why is the amperage less? Well, the suck, squeeze, bang, blow, right? The air can just come out of the cylinders like this. There's no mechanical resistance, right? When his plug is in, now the air has to go through the valves. Intake brings air in, exhaust puts it out, right? Now, if we take that same motor and we put 50 weight oil in it, which you should never do, by the way, right? And you know that. If you do that, well, guess what? The amperage is going to go up. Why? If it's cold out, that thick oil is going to be like this with the piston. Probably won't even start. Probably won't crank if it's real cold. Does that make sense? So electrical and mechanical, two different resistances. 
everyone good with the current on the pump? I'll move off of that. And we will use an EVAP solenoid. Okay. So what do you think an EVAP solenoid pulls? Well, first of all, what are you really holding back? When you're not holding back pressure, mechanical resistance, from a solenoid, like we'll be looking at over here in a minute, this is a VVT solenoid, right? This here is only holding vacuum back. That way, we can basically suck a, you know, the hydrocarbon vapors out. Does that make sense? Otherwise, if you can't suck the hydrocarbon vapors out, we may have a problem here. And if this was a normally closed valve, meaning no sucking, right? Can't, can't suck anything. It's impossible. That's normally closed. The computer gets power, gets ground, and then opens it up at the right time to suck the hydrocarbons in. Does everyone understand that? Any questions? So now I'm going to hook this one up. I'm going to take the black, put it in a negative. And if I did it backwards on this, this may have a diode in it. I know this one don't, but it may. Okay. You take the Ford vapor management valves. You take some of the EGR valves, all that. It looks like my battery on one of these is going low. And I want you to take a look at this amp clamp. Here's what you don't want to happen. Let me move this down. Murphy's Law, it was good before. You see that red blinking? Battery low. You see the blinking? Yes, you can. Okay. All right. So now we're going to know that is not going to be as accurate over there. All right. Let's unfreeze this. Okay. And what do we think this solenoid is going to pull? I got continuity. See the green light? Yes. Okay. What do you think this is going to pull? I want to zero this clamp. Well, since it ain't holding a lot back, it's only going to pull three to 400 milliamps, okay, if it was good. Now, let's, oop, we got A here. We got to take that. I got to move that line down. Get my cursors back up and move that line down. Is that the same? So you see that? About 440. The amp clamp. You see what happens when you got a bad battery? We're drifting. We're not getting the right reading. Very important to make sure you have good 9-volt batteries in your amp clamps. This one turns off good. So does this, but I used it a lot. And I guess the battery was not the greatest, right? Just the way it is. So this was a bad purge solenoid. It wasn't pulling, and please write this down. If you pull more than 1,200 milliamps, 1,200 milliamps, 1 1.2 amps, for more than six milliseconds, and by the way, when I do this, that's pretty quick, right? Look at that. That's a second. That's a 1,000 milliseconds in that second. I can't operate that fast, nor can you, not the great Bruce Lee either. No one can move that quick, right? So when you just think you're going to hit a button, go, oh, I just did it quick. Smoke show, you're going to burn something out if you hooked up wrong. This solenoid was given a problem sticking. Sometimes the amperage did go over 1,200 milliamps. Any questions on that? Well, can you say hi to Sean's high school students? Oh, hey, Sean's high school students. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm looking so ugly today, but that being said, I hope you get something out of this. And Sean, thanks for sharing with a bunch of people. We know we always get a lot of people sign up, a lot of people watch this. And if you have a question, please let Sean know. He can type it in and we will take it from there, right? So Sean's high school students, where are you at, Sean? What state? If you give us a state where you're at, we'll... Yeah. Yeah, I always forget that delay. So, Sean, where are you at? I know it's Delay City. And as we're Delay City here, I am going to be putting these leads into this solenoid that we're going to be using in a little bit. Yes, you can. 
Michigan. Hey, it was out there at Auto Wares out there in Michigan. Um, great event. Next time it comes up, you guys should go out and check it out. Okay? And you got a good teacher there. Not because you're watching me, but there's other videos and uh, stuff out there as well. But you'd be surprised with these little lunch and learns, the stuff that you could pick up. And if you ever have any ideas or something you would like to see, because I always have to pull these things out of my head, and this one was a real close one because I've been on the road so long. I was like, boy, what am I going to do? And I remember a lecture class I just did. I taught one on the road, and I taught one here uh, not long ago. And I said, you know what? People always have a problem with this type of stuff here. So I want to make sure that everyone has that down pat. Let's take a look at this EGR. Is there a question there? Two questions. Okay, Anthony, would you be able to roughly calculate KEO EO fuel pressure by measuring injector current by subtracting what pull without pressure in the rail? Mm -hmm. um, so, Anthony, without pressure in the rail, the current of the injector would be low. With pressure, it would be close to an amp. Um, so, usually, I see seven, eight hundred milliamps on a fuel injector with no flow because you see that one to 10 micron screen? You probably can't see it. Yeah. I don't think you can see it there. It's pretty tight. But anyway, let's see, whoa. Oh, yeah, that's the, that's the sign with the screen. So you see that little black thing right there? That's the screen. That's a one to two micron screen. Okay, not a 10, but one to two. And when we do injector flow, we take those out and we ultrasonically clean them, then we put new filters in there, okay? And that's that little black piece right there near my nail, okay? Right there, okay? So that's a good question. Uh, what are the symptoms of intermittent sticky purge uh, valve? So an intermittent purge valve could be a flow issue. You may get a DTC for flow or something maybe implausible, meaning it don't make sense, okay? But in the case where it goes over, where this purge valve goes over one amp, you know what happens? Over 1.2 amps, 1,200 milliamps. What happens there? I will give you a dormant T-shirt for the guy who puts that in, or gal puts that in first. And I know I have one of my students, Mary, on there somewhere. So hey, Mary, up in Massachusetts, okay? Um, what would happen here? If I went over 1,200 milliamps, 1.2 amps for more than six milliseconds, you could win a t-shirt. Okay. We got an answer? No, got a question. Uh, we'll just wait on it. Okay, you know what? I'll address that question by, can you do a dynamic resistance test with a math channel on a scope? Well, Thomas, uh, you could do a bunch of stuff, but that's way harder to do. You don't take the backhoe out, okay, if a shovel will do the job. So that may not be impossible, and it may not be as accurate. Just like I showed you, if we put that example we had in the slide, if I put my meter in series, that's the most accurate. These things are magnetic steel bars with windings giving us a conversion that's pretty close. Why do I say use this? So you don't burn your meter out. So I can get a reading easy on my scope. Okay. Does it Smoke show. So Robert Milstein, okay. So I don't know if that's one of the guys that works for Bob that was just in the class, but put your email in there, Milstein. And hey, Bob and crew. Maybe Leo's there today as well. Hey, Leo. Um, you will burn the driver out in the computer. Once you exceed the amperage on this, whether it's a mechanical problem, okay, remember, mechanical resistance or electrical resistance, you're going to do a smoke show. All right, let's look at this EGR valve in the sake of time. We don't have much time left here. And we do have a survey at the end that they always tell me to remind you, and I forget. But I usually ask you if it was good, let a Y, if it was bad. So I'll ask you that again. Let's take a look at this EGR valve. Ready? I got continuity. Oh, now we're on that camera. I got continuity. And here we go. You hear the noise? 
So I'm going to move, oh, my amp clamp fell asleep here on the scope. I'm going to take my measurement here, and I'm going to go to that red line, and I got 152 milliamps, okay? One amp, 520, and look, pretty damn close this time. Okay? Now, if this EGR took more than the 1.2 amps, okay, it is. You'll go, gee, it's doing that. It, Why, well, it must have burnt the computer. Hang on. How does that work? It's duty cycled. It could be 50% on, 20% on, 80% off, 30, 70. You get the idea. So if you duty cycle something, you're not going to burn the computer out. This valve was replaced for a totally different reason. Oh, it's Luke at Milstein's. Good. Hey, Luke. That's right. You were in the class. But you know, as I usually say, I can't remember my own name, is the reason why I use one letter. Okay? Makes life a little easier. Another question. Another question. Okay. Will the DVM ever burn an ECM reading if reading voltage? No. No. Your DVOM will not burn a computer out if you're reading a voltage reading on something. Excuse me. You'll burn your fuse out in your meter reading amperage. Okay. You could, in a way, burn something out. And this is why on airbag, yellow wires on a car, airbag, you need the impedance of, hey, Luke, you should know this one. What is the meter impedance that you need? Because if you have too low resistance, that airbag, this could be dangerous. I'm going to make it a little fun here. could smack you in the head. But an airbag smacking you in the head could end your life, right? So no fun there. So we want to know that an airbag has to be used with a special meter resistance. What is that resistance? Good. Uh-uh. No. That's it. That guy, Curtis. Curtis got it. Give him a T-shirt. Curtis, put in your email. Not 10 ohms. 10 ohms, boom! Smack in the head. So, Luke, that would have smacked you right in the head. You, you don't want that. 10 million ohms of resistance. So the other guy, whoever it was there, yeah. cool. All right, let's look at this. Uh, I'll zoom this thing in a bit. Oh, we're good. We're zoomed. Here we go. Now, I want you to take a look at this carefully. Now, this is duty cycled as well. Every 100 millivolts equals an amp. So you're reading a little over, and no matter how you duty cycle this one, notice that amperage gets real high. This one took a vehicle computer out on a VVT. Okay, So this took it out. You don't want anything like that ever happening. So before you put a component in the vehicle, how long has it taken me to use my power probe? I got it hooked up to a battery pack, okay? And go through these components before I put them in a car. Minutes that you will basically save time and save a component. What's the most expensive fuse on the car? Hmm, is it that big, big maxi fuse, the mini fuse? No, 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 no. It is the PCM. A computer is the most expensive fuse. And you just hitting a button or a component with low current, you're going to have a problem. Okay. Here we'll do our last one in the sake of time. Probably the last one here. We're going to look at this setup. And I think I may need bigger ends here. But you know what? I'm going to cheat. I'm going to cheat here in the sake of time. I'm going to take this little clamp, go on one side of the valve. Okay, and then I'm going to go here on the other side to show you I got continuity. Can they see that? There's a green light. And I'm going to hit this. This is a purge solenoid. Okay, look how low the milliamps are here, 40. So this is very, very low. And I'm going to bring my cursor down here.
that is 360 milliamps and on the meter 394 but remember that amp clamp is going down so I have a bit of a a different reading here this is actually a good solenoid okay there's nothing wrong with this one and we notice we had a difference between this one this was pulling more remember there's only sucking on this this is only sucking to let the hydrocarbon vapors out right because it's a normally closed valve so we don't have something like this EP uh, not EPC this VVT solenoid here right and I think I have time for one more could it take this fuel injector a little bit different than that man and you got to remember some injectors are low resistance injectors don't be surprised to seeing them but they're duty cycled on a special circuit when we went over fuel and you could look back at the dorman lunch and learn look for the fuel injector one and notice this type of injector can take one amp you could have throttle bodies take six or so amps you could have a variable pulse width injector take seven to ten amps and those injectors seven to ten and six amps low resistance injectors with a special circuit and it pulses it real quick like that and then it switches to an intentional resistance type of ground high resistance to lower the current flow okay so please be aware of that let's check this real quick and then we'll finish up with a couple of things get you on your way I know uh, and I thank you for taking the time to spend your lunch time with me okay Oop, I got to get this on here come on I have continuity let's look at the scope and I'm gonna have to do the adjustment here let's see if my fingers can do this all at once ah. So 840, and this scope, uh, the meter said 9-something, but you see my 840? That's because there's no fuel pressure. Same thing, the pressure would have went right through here, raising it to approximately, this one would be probably 1,200 milliamps. Okay. Any questions before we move on? Uh, I know this is somewhat out of the topic, but would you, would bed compression effect spark strength yeah it would so that is out of the realm we try to stay with that but that's okay um, let's look at a couple of slides before I let you go and is there another question Dory says when testing injectors is it best to check what's that say SI, SI. oh surface information for component testing method and I would tell you no now here's the reason why even if it's a GDI injector they're just going to tell you to do and that's a 65 volt injector they're going to tell you check ohms remember it's not taking into effect mechanical resistance or high fuel pressure which would be mechanical resistance and current flow the best thing to always do is what we did here is test current current is the best thing okay we are reading MV. Yes, you're reading millivolts converted to amperage. That is correct. Okay, I forgot what I did with my clicker. Here we go. Let's look at these past uh, couple of slides here before we let you go. We want to make sure that uh, you know about our TST event, November 16th, diagnosing using a lab scope and much more with Jeff Zide from ATS. Jeff is their hotline guy that works for Bernie. Um, we have upcoming instructors. We got Bernie Thompson in December, John Thornton in January, Scott Manor, Bill Fulton, Scott Brown, Brendan Steckler, Kenny Sanders, and for the big event, Keith Perkins and Gary Smith uh, with a couple of things. Don't forget to go to our dorm and lunch and learn. And we had a day and a half of training that should be up for sale on the dorming website. So if you want to see something on electrical, 
uh, with uh, Pete Meyer, uh, myself doing hybrid EV. Uh, all these classes, I think, were three or four hours. I can't remember. I think they were four hours. Uh, so you can see that. It come with handouts. And uh, we had Sweet Owen on heavy-duty brakes. And uh, Ken Zander's doing computer stuff. So check that out on the Dorman website. Now, if you don't have any questions, I have a question for you. We got a bunch of questions here before oh, one we more go. Question. Why okay. should be used on an O2 sensor? On an O2 sensor, only on the heater, okay? The heater can take up to three amps, usually duty cycle. All right, not on the O2 sensor itself. If you're looking at an air fuel ratio sensor, there's currently only an amp clamp out that can do it. It's probably a couple of thousand dollars. So you would have to put your meter in series. And they usually like staying like zero amps to a negative three to a positive three amps. Negative three would be a rich, positive three would be a lean. I have the last question for you and I want to thank you again. If you think this was helpful, type in the letter Y. If you think it was helpful, letter Y. If you think it sucked, you got nothing out of it, I wasted your time, put the letter N, okay? Letter N if it was no good, letter Y if it was good and helpful to you. And we'll see you next month on another Dorman Lunch and Learn. Also check your email. Many times we have Dorman classes at night that are a three hour webinar. And we have some great instructors like Kenny Zanders, uh, Sweet Owen, Pete Meyer, or myself. So check them out. Go to the Dorman Training Center. And once again, I thank you for your time. Please give us feedback and any ideas that you have. Have a great day. Thank you on behalf of Dorman Products. I'm G. Trulia. Take care.